involves protein synthesis. You can sort of see the feedback loop there. There are things which don't necessarily look like feedback loops. It turns out that receptor clustering has an effective feedback cycle, but it isn't obvious from the chemical relationships. This isn't even, this isn't my work. This is Harel Shuval's uh, study. I, I did a whole bunch of analyses which says that simply the process of moving molecules from one position in the cell to another can set up uh, situations where you have these intersecting things. And if you get really, really exotic, you can actually get multiple stable sta states. But let's not go there. The point is that there are many ways to get multi-stability multi uh, through chemical signaling and molecular traffic and so on. Um, here's. Yeah. So in biology, if it's possible, it probably happens somewhere, but um, but not randomly. It will have been, you know, honed by evolution, so it happens in certain circumstances and not others. So neuromodulators, for example, for example, when you're extremely stimulated or you know something terrible has happened or something very exciting has happened you'll remember some things very vividly and everything else will be a blur, yeah? So the process of setting down and retaining information is very, very strongly modulated by your emotional state. And it's all chemical, sorry? Uh, I, sorry, I didn't follow? Yes. So, this set of chemical events is something that we model and are trying to understand as the basis of storing information in cells. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Okay. Okay, so this configuration, for example, is capable of storing information for many, many years because it happens to withstand a lot of chemical noise. And there are others that uh, we've also analyzed. Okay. So, that's an ex so that sort of illustrates one uh, situation where chemistry does some very interesting computations. Yeah? So let me just give you a glimpse of how we are working towards, and this is a continuing process, how we're working towards getting the numbers. And it's a really hard problem. Um, so first of all, first question is why do we want to bother by digging down to the level of details of all these molecules? Well, I have a, a sort of a mnemonic. It says PERCH. You were, it's inter important because a, parallelism. Every single one of these little dots is a, is a dendritic spine. And in principle, if this analysis is correct, each one of those can store in the information independently. And that's useful. That's good. Yeah? Parallelism is a very, very important aspect of why the brain can do so much with so little power. Uh, emergence. You can get properties coming out of these systems, and I'll show you one in a little while, which are really quite powerful computations, and they're happening at this amazingly efficient and tiny scale. So that's good. Robustness. These, these processes have to be robust because if you want to store information well or if you want to be able to recover from damage, as Sri was talking about, you need to have a system built into the brain which is capable of recovering from all sorts of insults, um, let alone the fact that you may have gone and had a couple of beers, which is also a pretty profound insult to your system, and yet, Usually you remember something afterwards. <laughs> Depends how much you've had. <laughs> okay, connections and context. This is something which the chemicals are, are setting up and defining the connections and uh, also modifying them. And homeostasis and housekeeping, which is sort of, people ignore it, but it's actually absolutely crucial to keep everything running properly. But if you want to talk about uh, value to society or other kinds of things, well, there's development. How does your brain even get to the connections, the structure it has? That is the basis of, that is the outcome of thousands of decisions of chemical nature. Disease and damage are all things that require you to be thinking about the detailed chemistry. Okay, so after that plug for it, let me explain how we go about it. And this in a, in a nutshell is what we do. First of all, the equations are not complicated. It's just that there's a whole bunch of different distinct molecules with different rates. That's really the basis of it. We use a multi-scale multi physical and chemical modeling framework. It's something we call MOOSE. I won't discuss it. But it models things at the 
uh, molecular level, at the, at the subcellular level, at the Hodgkin-Huxley, at the electrical level, and, the and at the network level. So that lets us uh, look at the interplay of these events. We build up, we're building up and continue to build up a database of experiments. And what we have is this database is not simply saying, look at that paper, look at that paper. It's a structured database which we can use to drive the simulator. We can say, look at this experiment in the database and run that experiment. Yeah? So we've uh, got this system of automating tests of models by experiments. And since we can now test the models automatically, we can use, use this for parameter optimization over hundreds of experiments. Yeah? So optimize over many experiments. And then, of course, we do what we really set out to do, which is to ask questions about biology. OK, so this is what it is. It's fine sim. So we have model defined in a certain form. We define our stimulus, and we define the uh, expected outcome from the experiments. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stochasticity is in there. The solver is stochastic. Yeah, yeah, it's public, it's published, you can, you can download it from GitHub. It keeps evolving, so it's a, yeah, it's there. And we're, we're trying to set up a consortium to actually bring in a lot more people to participate in the, in the development of the data, because these are stochastic, they're not, they're ODEs implemented in a stochastic manner using something called the Gillespie algorithm. Yeah. It's mass action chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, okay, we can get into the details. It's a way of systematically sampling from the chemical master equation. Okay, so then we run it. So here's our database of experiments. Then we run it through the simulator and we compare the uh, experimental outcome with the model out outcome and go back to optimize it. We have, uh, for example, here's our reference model, and each of these is a block, each of these has got tens, twenties of reactions in them. Um, we have a single reference mo uh, model out of which a given experiment may only pertain to a small fraction. So then we uh, look at that, we tell the system, look at this subset, model it, put in the blockers, the stimuli, uh, compare the, the inputs and outputs, and we can do many kinds of experiments ranging from standard chemical ones to various electrical ones. We can do LTP stimuli, we can do um, field potentials. We can do all sorts of things with this kind of, with this system. It varies. Some of these experiments uh, run for, I don't know if you can see this, this one runs for 35,000 seconds, in other words, 10 hours. So that's the experiment. But the simulation takes uh, of the order of sub-second to a few minutes. Yes. And because we have hundreds of experiments, we run them all in parallel and so Optimization takes, we have to have a cluster to do that because every step in the optimize, every point in the optimization is running 100 experiments. So, yeah, so it, it scales up. And, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good problem to, to scale up. It's nice, it's embarrassingly parallel. Yeah. So that's what we do. And experiments aren't always precise. So you have to exercise scientific judgment and say this experiment is something I believe. You have to give it a weightage uh, compared to some other experiment. And that's, that's where you uh, build up your analysis. So anyway, so we're doing that. This is where we are at present. The model continues to grow and get more wonderful and, and complicated. The database is, is small at present, but these are very, very heavily curated things. And as I said, we're setting up a consortium to try and scale this up. Okay, so what I'll do, how much time do I have? Uh, five minutes, cool, that's perfect. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll end with a glimpse of something actually quite cool that came out of playing around with these chemical systems, uh, an emergent computation which we think is actually very important and actually Dilauer is also working on that. Um, so let me tell you. So let's look at it this way. Supposing you get a sequence of stimuli, yeah? Let's say it's a sequence of notes in a song. Hmm? And supposing then these sequences, this, this, these stimuli, these notes were represented by different bunches of neurons. That's what these clouds represent. So that's one set of, let's say, a thousand neurons, another thousand, these are different ensembles. And let's say, again, for the sake of argument, um, that there's a connection coming from one of the neurons here to this particular piece of a cell. So this would be of the order of, say, 20, 30 microns of a dendrite. Hmm? So this small section gets an input from that cloud, 
A little bit further along, it gets an input from that and that and that. Now you note that the spatial order here is the same as the time order I'm ascribing to the stimuli. So let's say it's five notes of your favorite song, happy birthday to you or whatever, yeah? So there you go. Now, I'm, I'm sort of giving away the, the, the approach, the idea, which is that supposing your stimulus comes in, sets off a chemical event which propagates by diffusion, simple reaction diffusion, right? The next one comes in, it too gets set off, but if the tail of this has reached there by then, it's boosted, yeah? Similarly, next one, and it's boosted, and this happens non-linearly, so that if the inputs happen to come in in the same order and at the right timing as the propagation of this traveling wave, then you would get a very, very strongly boosted output. And if, on the other hand, it was some kind of scrambled thing where it started from there and went there and there and there, then the propagation would not be amplified at the successive steps. And so this is a way then of chemically distinguishing a sequence from a non-sequence. Something, the same notes, happy birthday to you, but done in the wrong order, don't actually make a song, or they don't make that song. So, and the idea is that you, this is being implemented through very, very simple chemistry. And very, very small scale, very, very low power. So, does it work? So we started out, I started out playing with spherical cow models. Everybody knows what a spherical cow is, right? No? I thought this was a standard term. I, I, may, in, I recently gave this uh, talk like this in uh, Banaras, and there I changed the cow to some other animal. Um, <laughs> but, but the standard term is spherical cow. What it means is it is a very complicated system reduced to just one or two variables. Okay, only the, the radius. Okay, <laughs> so here it's a, it's a two, it's a two variable, uh, each of these is a two variable equation. I tried a bunch of them. Uh, two of them work well. One is so, something you may be familiar with. This is the Fitzhugh-Nagumo equations. And then this is a, a bistable switch. Let's, without getting into the details, this is what they do in a point model, but this is what they do in a spatially dis, dis, distributed model. So here's the stimulus coming along, tra traversing in sequence from there to there. And there are the spots of activation. I'll just run it one more time, yeah? And the question is, will this build up as compared to the alternative? So the short answer is yes, of course, and I'll show you a movie of that in a moment, but just to orient you, uh, what happens if you get the sequence in time is that you get a nice big build up, and if you get any kind of scrambled input, it fails to build up. And this is perhaps more vividly seen in this simulation where blue is the sequential one, you can see the inputs coming in in spatial order. This is space. So blue builds up and red does not build up. So I'll just run it one more time so you can compare. You'll see that the input to red sort of jumps around. The input to blue comes in a nice sequential order. Okay, so this is reaction diffusion chemistry. Very, very simple set of equations. In fact, so simple it's not really even chemistry and yet it can do uh, sequence discrimination. Now, the brain is not a spherical cow. This is a marvelous and I find terrifying image by Sven Truckenbrot and his colleagues where each of these, this haystack stuff are proteins. The little balls are vesicles, which are little globules of chemicals. Uh, all of the pink things are receptors of various kinds. These are structural proteins and that is the synaptic release site. So this whole thing is half a micron across, okay? This is what your brain is working with. So this is the computational engine underlying, underlying this. Yeah. So there's a lot of computation that you can do with this. So I'll just skip the stuff. We put in lots and lots of these details. We put in much more complicated chemistry. We distributed it over the whole cell. This, to my knowledge, is still the most elaborate simulation of a single neuron of this kind ever done. And uh, what, we, what we'll do is we'll focus on just a couple of small regions with a, a few spines on them, um, which you'll see now. So that's the sequential one, that's the scrambled one. So there you can see the activation going along in order and building up. And I'll run it one more time. In this one, you'll see the activation hopping around and it fails to build up. It started there, it jumped there, it jumped there, it jumped there. And then it died down, whereas that one stayed up. And all of this, what I really want to stress is that this model cell is getting inputs at all of these spines at random. It's, a, it's, 
it's pulling this out from a huge amount of background activity, and it's detecting when there's sequential input in one case and not in the other. Yeah? So this is something that uh, one can uh, uh, model in much more detail than the simple spherical cow version. Okay, so finally, I'll wave my hands vigorously now and make some speculations about machine learning. Um, so here we go. So the idea is that this is a, perhaps a primitive, a building block for computations that a neuron can do, along with many other computations it does. Yeah? This is just adding to its repertoire. And you can have sequences coming in all over this cell body. As I said, there's, there's like a centimeter worth of dendrites on each of your cells. And we only need uh, uh, some 10, 20 microns in order to do the sequence recognition. So there's a lot that you can do there. So at one level, the cell is doing summation and integration and threshold detection at each of its branches. At another level, it's modulating it with various kinds of inhibitory inputs. At another level, it may be doing the sequence recognition. That's what these uh, little uh, colorful rainbow things are. And and on top of that, it's mod modulating the, the synaptic weights. It's storing information at each of these synapses. So I'm saying these are all things that every single cell in your brain can do. And so when you think of the computations that an LSTM node does, I'm not saying it's isomorphic, but I'm saying that they are comparable kinds of computations that an LSTM node does. And this is something that a single cell in your brain can do. So, so the cell can do within it, it can do time and sequence recognition. LSTM nodes are very good at doing that. Uh, it has learning and state information at all of its synapses. That's also true of LSTM nodes. There's a difference, of course, at least to zero order. There's just one output from a neuron. LSTM nodes have, anyway, we can get into that discussion. So maybe it's not surprising that your brain can do pretty amazing things, given that every single cell can do pretty amazing things. So just to remind you, there's a lot of cells out there, and every cell has lots and lots of synapses. So there's Lots of computation out there. Okay, so that's the what I discussed. We discussed chemical computation. We went looked at memory. We looked at how we're trying to model this with some level of uh, foundation in data, and then we played around with some speculation. Thank you. Yes. Now, the is sort of like a, some form of computational model so that reversible computations, for example, are extremely low and extremely slow versus not. So, uh, you know, coming back to your last thing where you actually try to connect it to LSTM, like, but you get this weak one. So, uh, the question is, so what is the time scale at which, say, the chemical or chemistry based uh, one unit of computation that you are thinking about? Mm -hmm. In hardware. Yeah. So the time scale of this computation, I should have mentioned, is behavioral time scales. So in other words, the same, it's of the order of a second. Yeah? So there's so a bit less. Like 10 to the power of 9. So yeah, there's a factor of 10 to the power of 9 in terms of speed difference. Right? But in terms of energy efficiency, there's probably. <laughs> Well, these aren't reversible. These are relying on hydrolysis of ATP as a very fundamental biochemical basis. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's no. It's just that it's been implemented by evolution, which pays a huge price for energy consumption, right? So we've got to, we've got to be energy efficient, and this is this is. Another way to look at it is, let's look at a single E. coli cell. Yeah? No neurons there, it's just one cell. It does an incredible range of computations. And so what neurons are doing is they, they're inheriting that huge battery of computations, so to speak. And on top of that, they are layering electrical computations, which are much faster, and therefore allow you to catch that effortlessly. Yeah? <laughs> That would be a bullet then, you have. <laughs> yeah, but possibly. Um, that may explain the energy difference. Or the 
Right, but even so, you know, even it's only now that robots are just barely beginning to get to the point of being able to catch something like that. Yes. <laughs> So neural computation is driven by evolution. It is as accurate as it needs to be for survival. I mean, when you, for example, catching something like that requires incredible precision. It needs timing precision. It needs incredible coordination of the muscles. The visual processing is, is very high. Um, but other things may not require such, kind, such levels of precision. Very, well, yeah. It's evolved, evolved to be effective. Yeah, you could, you could do, I've, I've actually done a back of the envelope, anyway, yeah, we, let, we can discuss it offline. So, uh, so, uh, so, because you wrote time, so we will take all the questions offline, and, uh, yep. thanks. Thank you.